rejoice, 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 for this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. For the word says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We welcome you, my friends, to the CNJ of the Lord, your Presbyterian church, as we have come to worship Almighty God. This is a church of five generations. And one of the things we always try to do is accentuate those who are up and coming. And so we're grateful today to present to you a, a choir offering of our youth, of our children. And so I want you to please just sit back, relax. As a matter of fact, no, don't sit back. I want you to stand to your feet right where you are and give our children a great round of applause as we celebrate them as they lead us in song.
please pray with me. Eternal God, we thank you for being the balm in Gilead. God, we thank you for your healing power and your restoration power. God, we thank you that being a God who sits high and looks low, you have the answer to our prayer. God, you have the comfort for our hurt. God, you are there with us in good and bad. And God, you're with us right now. We thank you, God, that as we have tuned in to your Holy Spirit, that we pray now that you will give us words that inspire, but most importantly, God, give us of the love that heals. We pray, God, that everyone watching, everyone hearing, everyone listening, everyone receiving, God will know that with you all things are possible. We ask now, God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts continue to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask this prayer in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. There is healing, there is restoration, there is also love that comes from Almighty God. Thank you, Dr. Monroe and Music Ministry for ministering to us today. We thank God for our youth that reminded us uh, that God is still alive and God still gives great energy. To God be the glory. Great things God has done to our audiovisual team and all of those here in the sanctuary and all those behind the scenes do know C and Jenkins that God is doing a wonderful thing in this space. Today, if you have your word, I invite you to turn with me to Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. We'll be reading 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 7 from a New Living Translation of God's Holy Word. Let us read the word together. Now, regarding the questions that you ask in your letter, yes, it is good to live a celibate life. But because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should, should, should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterwards, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command, but I wish everyone were single just as I am. But God gives to some the gift of marriage and to others the gift of singleness. Friends, this is the word of the Lord Thanks be to God. And today I ask that we will focus on verse 2 of chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, for this is where we will launch and take our, 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 our leaping point from. For verse 2 says, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. And my friends, with the aid of the Holy Spirit and your encouragement, I want to lift up this text and today preach on our subject, safe sex and a compassionate marriage that honors God. Safe sex and a compassionate marriage that honors God. You can type amen in the chat box right there if you want to. Amen. My friends, the Bible, as we know it, is a book of expectations and a book of explanations. My friends, the Bible, as we know it, is filled with instructions and it is filled with guidance. For the Bible, it, is not, it not only tells us of the past, but it forecasts the future. It not only talks about struggle, it also teaches about strength. It not only unpacks history, it plants a seed of hope. 
It not only leaves you with motivation and illumination, it is undergirded by inspiration that's connected through salvation. The Bible, my friends, talks about an expected Messiah who would crush the head of the serpent. It tells us of an expected people from a servant named Abraham. It teaches about an expected new covenant and return of Christ. It tells us of a new creation and a Sabbath that has no end. The Bible, my friends, gives us a word that will help us. It gives us a word that molds our character. It gives us a word that directs our decision. It gives us a word that governs our business. The Bible, it teaches us principles that help us conquer our circumstances, control our habits, forgive our guilt, and heal our sickness. It is that source, y'all, that renews our hope, revives our souls, quenches our thirst, and satisfies our hunger. Friends, the Bible, believe it or not, now it also speaks directly to our passion. It uncovers our intimacy. It reveals our relationships and the Bible discusses our desires. And y'all, it is from this backdrop that I want to speak to you for the next several weeks on the theme of the excellence of love. And today, particular, starting first, I want to speak to married folk. Then coming next week, I want to speak to single folk. Then coming the final week of this series, I want to speak to the other folk who may feel like you've been left out. Somebody say amen. But right now, led by the Spirit and guided by the Word, I want you to open up your Bible, if you will, get your highlighter out and your ink pens ready as we take a deep dive into our subject today and preach on safe sex and a compassionate marriage that honors God. Somebody type in the chat box. That's my word today. And if that is not your word, somebody ought to say, I'm so glad to hear this. And if that is not even your word, say, come on with it, Reverend. For let's go to the text. For, for when you read our scripture today, friends, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you can see clearly that God makes it very plain and God makes it very clear that the word does not apologize that married folks should have a good sex life. Married folk, you ought to be typing amen right there. But now you know the problem is that too many married couples or, or, or don't have a sex life at all or at least not a safe sex life. And therefore they, have, they, they, they do not have a compassionate marriage that honors God. Let me say that again. From, from the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I live and pray and then obey what the B. In the Bible, y'all, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, and you can see clearly that God makes it very plain, and God's word does not apologize that married folks should have a good sex life. Yet now the problem is that too many married couples have no sex life at all, or at least not a sex life that honors God that is safe. And how can you say that, Reverend? Well, research by Dr. Andy Atwood, a licensed marriage counselor and family therapist from the Midwest, reveals that there are 17 million married couples in the United States that never have sex at all. Meanwhile, uh, Dr. Lawrence Finer uh, has also revealed that sexual behavior before marriage has changed over time. His research, y'all, was based on interviews conducted with more than 38,000 people, of that 33,000 of them women, from 1982, 1988, 1995, and 2002, and it showed that 99% of the respondents had had sex by the age of 44, and 95% had done so before marriage. Don't be typing your own name in the chat box. 
box right there to say my neighbor needs some help. Somebody say amen. Finally, y'all said that the likelihood of Americans having sex before marriage remains stable since 1950s. Though people now wait longer to get married and thus their sexual activity is increased on the single side. Let me take a sidebar right here, y'all, and explain to you that unfortunately that's the way that culture has, uh, has us thinking about sex. Think about it for a moment. Think of the movies that you have watched or the TV shows that you have seen and how do they portray sexuality. You see, it's almost spontaneous. It's, it's always extremely passionate. Both people feel the power, the power, the, the desire. Their animal magnetism begins to rise. They're turned on before they even touch one another. The sex is hot, the sex is intense, they enjoy it to the fullest, but now if you look at it closely, my friends, almost 99% of the time, it is either between two people who are not married, or it's between two people who are not married to one another. And the underlying message, my friend, in the movies and the media is that married folk are not supposed to be hot in the bed. They're not supposed to have sexual feelings. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, Marvin Gaye, sexual healing. It's, it's portrayed that, that married folk are not supposed to be passionate. And what the scientific reality of clinical studies shows, y'all, is that married folk who have sex, here's what I've learned, are healthier in their life. Healthy married couples have both more sex and are more satisfied in their sex according to socio. Married folk, I know you type an amen right now. You see, there, there, there's a reason for that because when you read what God's word has to say about sex, uh, when you understand God, now don't be writing me no letters, I'm just reading what God's word has said. What God's word has to say about sex, it is a subject, y'all, that we should not be ashamed of, and it's a subject since God talks about it, we ought to talk about it. You see, we learn that God gave sexuality to the man and the woman, the husband and the wife, so that they could share pleasure and enhance intimacy. You see, it does, it's given to us so we can do what? Give God glory. Doctors even tell us that sex is a wonderful tension reducer for all the hassle of life that marriage produces. It energizes the marital bonds. It enhances feelings of desire and desirability. And yet we have the statements like the one from Dr. Andrew Atwood, an expert again in marital relationships, where he says that more than 17 million married couples in the United States don't have sex at all. Now, believe it or not, this is exactly what Paul was writing to the church at Corinth about. For Paul, y'all, writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, he says, hey, this is what he opens up his letter and he responds to their question. The, the Corinthians had written Paul. Here, here's what we read. The very first part of the verse says, now for the matters that you have wrote about. Paul, y'all, was the spiritual dear Abbey of his day. And old folk know if you ever had a question that you wanted an answer to, write dear Abbey. And in about two or three days in the newspaper, dear Abbey would read you your response. But, but you see, when, when, when anybody had a spiritual question, they would write to Paul. And evidently, my friends, there was a whole lot of questions about sex and marriage in the church at Corinth. The questions that the Corinthian church had, which, by the way, the Corinth church was a wild and crazy church when you look at its history. The Corinth church, what goes on or went on in the Corinth church. But, but we'll get to that later. You see, these people had written to Paul, and they wanted to say, hey, Paul, we've got a question. 
you're our spiritual father. You founded the church. You led us to Christ. We, we've read the Bible. And believe it or not, the first question they asked y'all was about sex in marriage. And here's what Paul said to the Corinthians. Paul says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, the word touch, uh, Minister Donna, in this verse literally means to have sexual relationship. But evidently, uh, the church, y'all, had, 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 had gotten together and they were saying one or two things in their church meetings. Some people in the church were saying, you know, maybe sex is just dirty and maybe it's good for a man not to touch a woman at all and, and women not to touch men. And they were saying, or maybe it's good that we don't have sex at all. And that is what they were saying. Even if you're married, maybe only have sex at a time when you're trying to have a baby. Otherwise, it's not good to touch one another. And that's why they wrote the letter. That's why y'all might be writing me a letter next week. But let me go on. Paul, y'all, has, has got to set the record straight about sex in the married life. And as we are going to see, Paul makes it very plain for he's saying that sex is not something that is to be endured, it's something to be enjoyed. I know that's an amen right there. Paul says, y'all, that, 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 that God has a plan for sex, and sex is not to be endured, it's to be enjoyed. It, it, it really is God's gift to, to that God gave to the husband and the wife so that they might experience one of the most intensely intimate physical, spiritual, and emotional pleasures known to humankind. You see, sex is God's gift to, 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 that God gave to us. God has a plan for everything. God has a purpose for everything. God has a desire to move in your life, not just on your knees when you're praying, but in your bed with, okay, understand this, God is with you all of the time. See, 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 a God's plan for, for the normal, natural drive and desires that God puts within all of us is that we have a sexual desire that is fulfilled, and that sexual desire is done. In, that's it right there. The divine plan for sex can be summed up in one word, and that is marriage. And if you are a married person, you say amen. If you ain't married, you might want to type help me or, or don't, don't reveal too much of yourself. Say, help my neighbor, help my neighbor. And y'all, I, 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 I want to help you see what the word is saying. For, 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 for you got to make a serious footnote and most married folk, you're going to type amen right here because you see, uh, I will agree that over time, the quantity of sex in marriage will decrease. But, but, but what we should never decrease is the quality. Oh, come on, come on back here, come back here, come, 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 come here, Marvin Gay, sexual. Wake up, wake up, wake, wake up. <laughs> sex, my friends, is best when sex is right. Sex is right when it's within the boundary of blessings. And, and that boundary, y'all, is found in the marriage bed. You see, that's where sex is safe. That's where sex is sound. That's where sex is fantastic. That is where the marriage honors God. And if you would just stay with me for a moment, I, I want to share with, with you from the Bible what Paul says about safe sex and a compassionate marriage that honors God. But you see, there are three suggestions being made here, and I want to give credit and footnote and thanks to Pastor James Merritt, who did some research from the Gross Point Church about these three things that Paul says about sex and marriage and making it uh, an honorable to God. Three things, three words, remember these words, consummated, celebrated, and demonstrated. Number one, marriage is where the sexual act is consummated. 
marriage. Marriage is where the sexual act is consummated. L listen to verse 2 of this text. The Bible tells us is that, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each uh, person, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own Husband. Now, now, don't miss this, what Paul is saying here. This, this was written, y'all, some 2,000 years ago. And, and sometimes we get it confused thinking that Hollywood has introduced sex to the 20th century. No, but the Bible wrote this, is written 2,000 years ago, and it's very clear that sex has to be both, it is both a burden and a blessing from the beginning of time. Paul has great concern over sexual immorality, and there's a lesson there because there, you see, is there, there is no sin, no sin that you can commit that has more built-in negative consequences than sexual sin. Sexual sin, it has broken up more uh, marriages, it has broken up more homes, it has caused more hurt, it has shed more tears, it has spread more disease, it has caused more lies than all the drugs and all the alcohol put together. You see, God knew what God was doing, and, and I want you to understand here that God is trying to give good sex to you who are married. You see, God designed for perfect place for sex is in marriage. God designed a perfect place for you to be intimate is in your marriage. God said that it is when a couple comes together and is willing to make a lifelong commitment to the institution known as marriage, that that is where sex takes place and where and when it needs to take place. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexual immoral that tries to defile that bed. I, I want to quote Pastor Merritt again, y'all, because he lets it be known that sex was God's idea. And y'all, every time I realize and think about that it was God's idea and that God created sex, I can't help but to say God is good all the time. And all the time, come on, y'all about to, to say amen right there. God is, okay, let me get back to the text. You see, when, when God created sex, God put boundaries around this. Sex, y'all, let me give this illustration. Sex is like a train. Okay, work with me. Sex is like a train. And a train is a great thing as long as the train stays in between the tracks. Okay, a train's a good thing, but the train has to stay in between the tracks and on the track. And if a train ever jumps the track, it causes destruction, hurt, and even can cause some death. The train of sex is just like that, my friends. For God says that whenever sex runs between the track of marriage, sex is a wonderful thing. But if sex ever jumps the track, that's when it becomes a destructive thing. Let me give you point number two. If this, if this is helpful, let's type in the chat box, helpful. You don't have to reveal your sexual orientation or status. Just type helpful if it is. If it ain't helpful, just put it on your hard drive. You'll pull it up later in your life. Amen. Now, number two, number two, marriage is where sexual passion is to be celebrated. Again, number one, consummated. Now we're talking about celebrated. Paul says that marriage is where sexual passion is to be celebrated. It is not just where the sexual act is to be consummated, but where it is to be celebrated. Listen to what he says in verses 3 and 4 of this text. The husband should fulfill the marital duty to his wife and likewise of uh, the wife to her husband. 
the wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. Verse 4, and the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him, but also to his wife. Now, understand this text, y'all, for Paul is saying that, that love and affection is not something that you just give to each other if you're married, Paul is saying that it is something that you owe to each other, okay? It's something that you owe to each other, okay? Now, 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 now somebody who ain't been paid in a long time. <laughs> Come on, help me. I've been here 28 years, so I'm going to read and say, preach the Bible, amen, all right? So, so if you ain't heard it before, I'm going to say, you, it's what you owe to your partner. Paul, Paul is saying you owe it. You, you don't have a choice. Wives, you have a biblical responsibility to meet the sexual needs of your husbands. And husbands, you have the spiritual responsibility to meet the sexual needs of your wives. It's right there in the Bible. And when your partner requests intimacy, unless there's a strong physical or spiritual reason why you shouldn't do that, which is what I'm going to get to in a minute, Paul says that sexual love and affection ought to be given. And you see, y'all, that leads me to my last point that Paul makes in this text. Again, I thank Dr. Merritt for helping me with his research. And that is, this is what I call closes the deal. Number three, marriage is where sexual desire is to be demonstrated. Marriage is where sexual desire is is to be demonstrated. Paul says that marriage, that, 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 that's where you consummate, that's where you celebrate, and this is where you demonstrate. Look what he says in verses 5, 6, and 7. Paul says, do not deprive each other except by mutual consent. And that means both of you have to agree on it, and for a time, not indefinitely, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come to Together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this, Paul says, as a concession but not as a command. Paul says, I wish that all men could be as I am, but each man has his own gift and each one has their own anointing. One has this and one has has that. Work with me this morning, friends. Paul is letting it be known by scripture. He says that there may be times when you get together and there may be a burden upon you on something that blocks, shall we say, your intimacy. Maybe you have a burden thinking about your children or a burden about your finances or a burden about some physical problem. Or, or And the two of you say, we want to take a fast from sex. Okay, to take a fast from sex is like fasting from food, fasting from sugar, fasting from fried food, fasting from TV or anything. That's what a fast is. And Paul says it's all right to take a fast from it, but at the end of the fast, you got to break the fast. Let me just explain it to you this way. When you break the fast, it's like that word breakfast. Breakfast means that you're fasting from your last meal at night. But when you wake up in the morning, oh, I keep going back to Marvin Gaye. When you wake up in the morning, somebody ought to break the fat. Paul says the two of you come together and agree to abstain from sex for a period of time. And the implication, my friends, is that you do this but don't do it very long. Make it brief, Paul is saying, so when you come back together, your physical union is full of intimacy and attraction. I like the way that Dr. Andrew and Jonathan Taylor come, Audrey and Jonathan Taylor come and say it. She, they say it this way, people go where they feel welcome, but they stay where they feel value. We're going to talk about them next week because they have four principles that I'm going to lay both to married couple and to single folk. The four habits of all successful relationships are number one, be curious and not critical. Number two, be careful and not crushing. Number three, ask and don't assume. Oh, I like this. And number four, 
connect before you correct. Now, the good news, my friends, is that Paul lays it out that sex and marriage go together. Okay, come here, Forrest Gump. Like peas and carrots, they go together. Okay, come here, country folk. Like like, like gravy and chicken and rice and gravy and cornbread and buttermilk. They, okay, married folk ought to be having sex. Can I get an amen from somebody? Married folk ought to be having sex. The reality is, is that single folk are having sex too. So I ain't hating on nobody. I'm just trying to teach the Bible because the Bible says that sex is a gift from all money. God, let me close. Let me close with the story because I don't want us to overlook the fact, the fact that God gives us this gift. But oftentimes, if we're not ready to receive that gift, we need to pray for healing. And I don't want you to miss what, what Dr. Monroe and the ministers of music were singing for an intentional sermonic selection. Don't be discouraged. Don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. Because God can heal that part of your relationship. God can restore that part that you desire. God can lift up, God can put up, God can shape up your relation where you can give God thanks in your marriage. Got to give one closing story. A book was written by Dr. Willard, Willard Harley. Dr. Willard Harley studied 20 years couples and their sex life. He did not look at successful couples. He looked at hurting couples, couples who either the man had had an affair or the woman had had an affair or both had had an affair. It took him 20 years to do this study, y'all, and what he found in his study is that there were five things that both men and women, the five top reasons that they stepped out of their marriage and they started from somebody else. I want to share the number one for both men and women. Number one, the reason women stepped out of their marriage was because a lack, y'all, here it is, a lack of affection. A lack of affection. And brothers, that ain't nothing but just saying to your lady, I love you. You are important. Men, that is saying to your wives, you are the best thing that's ever happened to me. Men saying to your wives, I, 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 I washed your car, put some gas in it, run your bath water, I got your TV. You, you can be affectionate, brothers. And I guarantee you what Dr. Harley says is that those men who, who didn't do that, that's why the women went someplace else. The number one reason for men stepping out, the number one reason if for men, Dr. 20 years of study, was sexual fulfillment. And that's not just, women don't think it's just, just jumping in the bed and, 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 and knocking boots, no. What it means is that sexual fulfillment when that man knows that the woman of his life affirms him for who he is. The woman of his life is unashamed and unapologetic to say, that's my man, that's my boo, that's the one I'm with. And I share those with you today, y'all, and I pray that this word, I want you to play it over and over again. I want you to share it with some folk. But I want you to know this is what the word of God says. For God's word wants you to have safe sex and a compassionate marriage that honors God. And I want to pray right now for marriages. I don't want to overlook this opportunity. And if we were here in the sanctuary, I would ask if, if the married couples would be here and were not ashamed or embarrassed that they would come and, and just stand around the altar and pray. And I would ask that same thing if you are watching it with your spouse or, or significant other, that you would just join hands and just ask God to touch and that God will heal. There's healing for your marriage, healing for your relationship, healing for those moments when you felt that you had to use your body for, as a weapon or use your body as a negotiating tool. There's healing. I just pray that God will give restoration and healing.
right now. If you, if you've been watching and you have not made a decision to be a part of the community of faith, join today. Today is a good day to be a part of the CN Jenkins Memorial Presbyterian Church. Do know that I love you. We pray for you. We want to be a part of your life, your spiritual journey. I want y'all to have a great day, a wonderful week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May heaven shine upon you. May God be with you each and every day of your life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, be blessed and have a wonderful day.